And welcome back to Open Your Eyes on a cool Friday morning. It is fun Friday and I'll take you, tell you what, we'll take you down uh, uh, historical lean here. And of course it's going to be fun. Uh, it's always fun to learn uh, the, about the life of Belizeans who have definitely impacted our country. We are about to venture off into a conversation with none other than Yasser Musa, who is a historian and also the son of the individual we'll be talking about, who is none other than the Honorable Said Musa. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, my brother and sister, <laughs> Mark Kenny. And as I joked with you all after here, just know it is really an impossible thing to talk to you, not seeing you all, but I will try. I uh, definitely. <laughs> you know, um, when, when I saw the email came in uh, yesterday about the conversations, I said, uh, very interesting. And the reason for that is because I saw a piece on the, on the news uh, when your father had met, made mention that he'll be stepping down. And the piece that I saw spoke about uh, some of the words that we know your dad for. Let's talk about the lifestyle of him and what kind of person is Said Musa? Well, it's an opportunity I have today, and I am very grateful for you to invite me here to say, I mean, I can spend hours talking about my father, but I will spend minutes to try and condense what yeah. I know, which is yeah. 50 years worth of watching him. Wow. Even, I guess, I'm not admitting that I've been watching him since I was born, but that's... Yes, you know, clearly. <laughs> But it's so you're giving me a mission impossible. Thank you. So what I would want to start off with was sure. You know how people say how many people believe that the internet turned on the world for most human beings in terms of how they understand history. Yeah. So I will start from the beginning. Many young people, when they hear Said Musa, they think, "No, watch me, watch, watch yourself." yourself. Yeah. <laughs> then you the call me all kind of thing, but the, your name stink the road. So yeah. he, he, he he has. As a older statesman politician, uh, animated the uh, imagination of young people through his uh, capacity to speak. Mm -hmm. And so today, I would want to kind of anchor what I want to reflect on, yeah. on perhaps in my view, what is his one of his greatest strengths, which is his love of words and the ability to use those words in his favor. And obviously to have been involved in the thick of politics since 1974 when he first ran in the Fort George division yeah. and lost to Dean Lindo very narrowly, I think by 54 votes. Yeah. I think that first loss and his love for words and his love for people really uh, sim uh, started to build in him a fighting spirit which I am very uh, humbled that even in this moment when he recently suffered a stroke, um, I have been a part of the team to assist. Of course, my mother has been the central person being with him at home. Yeah. And we are very grateful that she is a nurse, but you know, it's also because she loves him that she's been able to take good care of him. But Seeing that fighting spirit, even in the personal context of illness, I think I am able to then make a more humanistic evaluation yeah. of what I'm about to discuss with you today. Yeah. You know, I, can I, I just wanted to ask um, before we start, how is he doing? Well, thanks for asking. And many people have asked thousands, as a matter of fact, this uh, green uh, WhatsApp thing keep when it first <laughs> happened, I thought it was going to explode and blow up my computer. Um, <laughs> But the outpouring of concern, and even from many of what people would call his political opponents, yeah. and people who had said, you know, over time, uh, had very critical things to say about his uh, style of leadership or his policies, whatever, many people. Mm -hmm. But also there was this other side of people feeling uh, that they wanted to know about him, wanted to know about his progress, and I want to report that he is doing great, mm -hmm. uh, even from the beginning when it was a much more difficult situation in early May. Mm -hmm. I never for once perceived or sensed being right there that he had, you know, felt, okay, this is an impossible thing to deal with. He was fighting 
from day one when that happened. And I have been lucky to enjoy listening to all the uh, talks and ideas coming from him and reading, and he continues to read a lot. And so, so I feel very blessed as a son, and I know our family feels very blessed. And the wider Belizean community feels very blessed that he uh, is making good progress. So thank you for asking that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, his, his, his retirement, I think, has allowed for the Belizean public to learn more about the history of his involvement in politics in Belize. And, uh, it, you know, as you clearly said in the beginning, there are certain generations um, that are adults at this point who never saw him as a prime minister. Um, and so you, you have to consider that there's so much more that they don't know from the involvement of, of uh, from the beginning in working along with George Price right now up to his retirement. For you, when, you, uh, when you're asked, um, you know, what about your father makes him uh, such a historic figure in Belizean politics, what would you say that one quality is for you? Yeah. Many things. That's the one quality. <laughs> the, the, the idea, for example, of retirement and the idea of um, you're finished and the idea that this is when it started. I always tell my students, because I teach history, that that is one of the most ridiculous things ever invented by human beings. Because what it does it gives you a sense of living dead, meaning like you are here and then you're here. But that's not how life works. We live in a transcendental spiritual space mm -hmm. where, for example, when people physically die, that doesn't mean our thoughts about them, our feelings about them dies as well. We, mm -hmm. They live on in, a, in, another, in another way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, yes, maybe we can say that his political moment mm -hmm. as a Fort George area rep has come to an end yeah but we cannot say that all the things that he has done can be encapsulated into one thing because yeah. everybody has their own ideas so i would want to stress today if i have a little bit of time on five quick things one let's get into it that in the 1970s one of the strongest forces in the entire world that was happening was the decolonization of the world meaning there was a 450-year project by Europeans to conquer, dominate, infiltrate, take over the rest of the world, especially in our case, the Americas. Mm -hmm. And we were not spared from that. Belize was British Honduras. Mm -hmm. We were colonized by the British. But in the 1970s, for the first time, under the leadership of George Price, who many consider the architect, and most people agree, and by, you know, there is no arguing this, the father of our independence, mm -hmm. that that was a moment when Belize, a small little tiny speck on the grand big bang of the nations of planet Earth, mm -hmm. the small speck said, look, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to the world. We're going to go to Africa, to the Middle East, and, and lobby and explain to people that we the people called the Belizean people deserve our right to self-determination, independence. Mm -hmm. And he, Said Musa, was a key player, a key, uh, like if you have a basketball team, he was right there as one of the five or whatever, yeah, franchise guiding player. Yeah. that process mm -hmm. to internationalize. Of yeah. course, there are many others, and this is not the time to go into all of that. Mm -hmm. But what I want to stress today was that that project, the independence 1970s project was a progressive project it was the nations like cuba nations like panama like nicaragua those were the nations the caribbean nations that came forward first to support us so that progressive idea and saeed's being involved in that i think was a good starting point to move forward toward independence and post independence yes uh, you know, I, I'm so glad that we're, we're able to talk about his life, but more so, he's also a, a, a family man uh, because a lot of people saw him as, and, and this is for me personally, a lot of people saw him more as just this politician, this politician who is making, a, a, making an impact, however they take that impact upon our country. 
what is what is he like uh, as a dad, as at at home, as a husband? What is he like like that? Well, I can't. I, he's not my husband, so I can't. Uh, answer that part. <laughs> I mean, your daddy man, your no as your. But yes, yes, I can certainly speak to him as a father, and I always tell this to my own uh, children that their grandfather is an extremely patient man. And patience is something you don't recognize when you're young. Yeah. And I certainly, uh, and I'm, I haven't said this as clear as I'm, I'm going to try and attempt to say this now on national television. Mm -hmm. I used to argue back and, you know, almost sometimes curse a lot at him when I was younger, a political talk, right? And just go off and about things that I thought was right. And, and he never pushed back and said, well, you know, you're young. You don't know what the hell you talk about. Mm -hmm. Never, ever pushed back on my thoughts, mm -hmm. never ever spoke unkind about my ideas, mm -hmm. never ever made me feel as if my ideas were not important. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, I was like, man, this man, man you answer me back, he didn't take me light, you know? <laughs> like, I, I interpreted it that way, like, yeah. not every, you know, you know, to give me the attention. Yeah. But later now, that I have obviously a more, um, I guess, marinated mind, mm -hmm. um, I can appreciate, and even as a teacher, I can appreciate that, that when a youngster, 13, comes and tells an older person who's supposed to be an authority figure, no, that is not correct. That is it. You have yeah. to be able to have the patience and the empathetic idea of putting that loudness or that rudeness or whatever you're perceiving it to be yeah. on a sideline and pay attention to what is the essential message. That's why I started my conversation today with the idea of valuing words. Yeah. Because if you are a val if you value words, you can pick the nuance of what's happening. Yeah. And I really believe that has emboldened him in, with, with the idea that he had in the cover of his book called With Malice Toward None. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people that meet him, yes, they might say, well, I don't agree with him on this, but it's hard for them to say, I don't like him mm -hmm. because he has that capacity when he's listening to you, that you don't feel as if he is being uh, abrasive or aggressive towards your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You did mention the word, um, uh, the, the name of the book, Malice Towards None. And Marlene, yesterday we had a conversation with, um, with Lucio, uh, Belizean icon again, and he actually went up against uh, people because there was this big, there was this big uh, um, concert, not necessarily a concert, it was a competition, a 3D competition to find out who would be the top band with the independent song. Lucio won, but your father's book is, uh, is entitled Malice Towards None, which means he voted for Bambike Bandula. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying that, um, you know, I, you know uh, he took a lot of blows, especially in the house. We've seen all these sitting at a house, uh, you know, he's, he's taking a lot of blows. He's taking that from the he's taking that from the public as well. Um, uh, how do you decipher that he 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 actually dealt with that? Uh, you know, because it really takes somebody as it really takes a rock to have those things bounce right off like that. How do you think he he dealt with that? There's a scene in the movie Finding Nemo where mm -hmm. Dory, the main character, the blue fish. So let's mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Blue fish is a very important fish. The blue fish has an encounter with Marlin, who is, a, I think, a clung fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Marlin is very doubtful and, you know, very uh, sarcastic and very negative, apathetic and dumb, no? almost, you know, negative to the world, worldview. But Dory says, hey, come on, you just got to keep swimming. swimming. Yeah. Just keep, keep swimming, swimming over and over. Now, what that says, that says that there are some of us who have the ability to develop fortitude, tenacity, mm -hmm. grit. Mm -hmm. And that is an important quality. Actually, if you ask me today with all this digital upheaval in the world of education, I would say to scrap all subjects, throw that in a crab hole, and focus on how do we develop the confidence in our young people, the tenacity, the grit, the fortitude, mm -hmm. the collaborative spirit of reaching out to others, the empathetic qualities. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where, at the heart, coming to your question, that Said Musa has been so effective over the years to be able to keep, just keep swimming, like Nemo would say, mm -hmm. or Dory, sorry, would say. And the point is, 
Look, at, look, let me give you a simple example. In 1982, one year after independence, he was the Minister of Education. And he developed, well, not him himself, but he uh, led the charge to develop a book, a, a book for young people for school called A Nation in the Making. It's a history book. Yes. That book was published, and less than one year later, when the government changed, that book was banned. That is the only book, a Belize book, that has ever been banned in our society. Can you imagine the, the level of sickness we have in our space? That one year after independence, we are trying to tell our story, and that is banned. But you would think, okay, well, make we give up now because the next side is saying this, blah, blah, blah. No, the fight continues. Democracy requires that you put your argument forward and have the people listen, process, imagine if that's part of their life, and then you move forward. It's not about, oh, well, they don't like it, so I can move on. No, man. It is a huge fight. And I think that is why later on in his, in his political life, so to speak, when he became prime minister, he was very adamant about the teaching of African and Maya history. And one year after he left government as prime minister, his government in 2008, that too was banned. But do you, but do you think that that should be a indication as to why we should give up never never surrender mm -hmm. the fight continues not just for us but for the future mm -hmm. and we are just baton passers in this process so i think he has done a great job with his own behavior his culture of conduct in passing the baton in very in many different ways i only give you an example of education i mean yeah. i could talk about cultural ideas as well as yeah. well as media ideas that he has forwarded but it's not about him it, it is about the idea and how he saw himself as the person maneuvering those ideas yeah you know i i can't help but but think of um you know one of the things that we know anytime you you read a biography or you hear someone's story um you know one thing is true uh you don't really experience success unless you experience failure yeah. Um, epic failure, epic failure too. Yes, yes, uh, that that makes the success even sweeter. But and so that's that's kind of what I wanted to tap into. I think the rise of your father in uh, the People's United Party, um, looking at him uh, challenging for the leader uh, of the party itself, and then um, becoming prime minister and getting the first historic second term. Um, is also something that I, I'm sure, and you were old enough to share in those moments as well. So, so talk to me about um, uh, how, how he values uh, the success that he has had in his own political career. Wow, that's a, amazing. That, thank you for that question. But actually, I don't know the answer to that because I never, ever heard him say anything about when he wins or when he loses. Oh, I feel great. And so it, that, people that know him know that about him. He's, he's never been like, had this feeling that, to me, that's what I was trying to talk about, the struggle, right? Because yeah. struggle involves losing and winning, failure and success. So you have to value both of them, if that makes any sense yeah. at all. To me, it makes a lot of sense, because I grew up in that context. Mm. What you have to value are the ideas that you're pushing forward. So I believe that he, yes, feels very personally, uh, accomplish of having all these whatever titles but mm -hmm. to me that is diminished inside of the way he projects himself you can't note that because as a matter of fact he doesn't he doesn't although all politicians let's be real all politicians have to be ambitious right and they have to be they have to want to win yes you have yeah. to want to win yes that's 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 where i'm trying to tread a very uh, strange needle because you also have to project yourself where people don't see you as, in the Creole, we have a beautiful world, gravalicious, mm -hmm. that you just want to win. <laughs> this is about me, and I, I just got a personal thing that I have to win, mm -hmm. right? It's not about the personal win. It's about the, the everybody, the whole win. Yeah. So to me, that is the, having, so having been in politics so long, that is how he was able to sustain this idea that, there is a bigger project out there. And that project is how do we decolonize our space we call the geography of Belize, but even more importantly,
how do we decolonize our mind? That's why he placed so much emphasis on culture mm -hmm. because he really believed that until the artists and the writers and the thinkers and the philosophers and the musicians and people like that who are more sensitive yeah. to the identity politics, to the who we are politics of a society, then we will just carry on and say, oh, how much imports we have, how much exports we have, what is the GDP? Okay, all of that is important. It's like a computer. If this screen wasn't working, then none of us will be talking, but nobody out there is saying, oh, wow, uh, Marlene has a nice um, computer, I guess, because her screen looks perfect or the cameraman. Nobody talks about that. Those are, that is irrelevant. Yeah. It is the idea that's important. Yeah. I have one more thing I wanted to add. But Jump in. Go ahead with your No, go ahead, go ahead. While I was talking, and while you guys are provoking me with this question so early in the morning, <laughs> this thought came up about Saeed. You, and, and I guess it's the historical thinker in me that brought this forward, right? He comes from a very diverse gene pool, let's call it that, mm -hmm. right? His great-great-grandfather was a man, Archibald Gibbs, who had come to Belize to run the central prison, the, the old jail. Mm -hmm. And that he was a white man, married a black woman, Eliza Coffin. Of course, in our family, it's Archibald that was spoken about more. Can he write a book? Him white, he's a man, blah, blah, blah. We know the patriarchy. This is not a show about patriarchy or about racism, but I could go into that as a... I could discuss Archibald and Eliza as a whole topic. The point I'm making is this. Eliza was invisible in my own imagination because I was quite curious to know who is my great, 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 blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. On the other side of his gene pool, there is Hamid, Hamid Musa, Palestinian, my Palestinian grandfather. Hamid means praiseworthy. I, I'll give you a quick joke. I, last year I was in Ramallah in the West Bank with my brothers and Said, and I had on a shirt that says, I love Hamid, but it was in Arabic and people were just laughing at me because I thought I was being cute. They were just like, hey, who, who says I love praiseworthy? That's, that's <laughs> stupid. So, but that, that's the beauty of language. But the point is that he knows his origin and the child of, um, uh, sorry, his grandmother mm -hmm. is Agostina Hernandez, became Gibbs, a Maya woman from the Yucatan, from the Masewal, Krusob, Yucatec, Maya people. Mm -hmm. So he, he said, knew that he was not a, a product, genetically speaking, of one thing. Mm -hmm. And that is Belize today. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have our ethnic and cultural uh, beings, but we also must recognize that history has not allowed for more than one story to be told. That's why he struggled as a political figure in politics and in government mm -hmm. to push for this idea yeah. of a diverse, of an inclusive society. Because if you guys, if you don't believe it, you can just look out and turn on your TV and, or your internet and realize that tyranny never sleeps mm -hmm. and that tomorrow is not promised. So you have to fight for that. And you have to have an idea as to and an objective and a goal as to what you're fighting for. So I had to bring in that family thing because the diversity and the inclusivity, I think, comes from his own yeah. genetic family background. And in characteristic traits, who, who does he attribute those to, being such a great orator or his tenacity as you speak of? So who does he want? Sorry, I didn't get the last one. The part. characteristics, the traits that you spoke of, being a great orator, being, uh, having the tenacity that he does, who does he say he get that from? I would want to say Eliza Coffin and Agostina Gibbs. I'm not going to stand up for the men. They got enough <laughs> there. The point, the point is... Great points there, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, the point is, yes, the point is that sometimes we do not recognize the erasure yeah. inside of us. And that is why we continue, for example, and I got a lot of heat for this on Facebook. That is why, I, and I will blast it until I die. The tenth idea that is just a stupid idea is foolishness. Because, and I don't have time for that, that's another show. Wow, I've, I've given myself two more shows. <laughs> like real hyper arrogance right now. But the reason I attack that so firmly is that that is like a cement of one idea of who we are 
rather than the erasure. I am interested in what has been erased, not is what is front of you. What is front of you is easy to parrot and repeat over and over, blah, 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 blah. That is a mindless, uh, in my view, obviously it's my view, a uh, operation. What is really important is to seek and to search the own, your own sense of curiosity about who you are and to discover it. It is in the discovery that you learn who you are and that if you recognize history and what has been done, how we've been bamboozled in terms of our thoughts, <laughs> then you will be able to untangle. I hate, I hate to bring up that uh, entanglement uh, idea again, but yeah. you will be able yeah. to untangle the craziness that's in our heads. I, I couldn't agree with you more. We could really have a conversation there about the process of unlearning who you were told to be. Unlearning, but, I like that. But I, 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 I can't help but thinking, you know, um, there are people who are watching this right now when your father uh, left, or when the, when the PUP lost, and uh, uh, your father faced what I would imagine one of the most challenging parts of his political history, times in his political history, it's kind of, it's been a dark cloud that, that's hung over his head um, for, uh, I'd say, the past decade. It's been continuously repeated as a part of political propaganda, all the challenges that the PUP experienced towards the end of the last term. How do you, I mean, when you think of, of looking back at the entire career that he's had, it still is perhaps the most um, memorable part or because it's recent or because we like to share bad news more than good news. Um, how do you put that into context? Well, I'd have to talk about the UDP. Um, and let me say this about the UDP. They, they, in 2020, in my analysis, what they're going to go through right now is what the PUP went through in 2007, 2008. Every organization, every institution, every person goes through upheaval, goes through trials, goes through tribulations, goes through failure. You ask me about that period after they lost and, you know, I personally um felt that it was my responsibility as a belize citizen and as a son of said mm -hmm. to continue working towards some of the ideas but not that it was his ideas yes he might have put the idea in my mind or he might have uh promoted that idea decades before me but an idea does not have a time code ideas are made for humans to, to romanticize, to imagine, to conceptualize, and then to make into action. Mm -hmm. Well, let me say something about where we are now, 2020, because we are weeks away from a massive general election. Mm -hmm. And I want to quote one of my father's favorite musicians and artists, Bob Dylan. He wrote a song, Bob Dylan, called Times They Are a Changing. And in one of the stanzas written in 1964, now tell me if this is not still relevant in terms of an idea. Mm -hmm. He says, come senators, come congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway. Don't block up the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. The battle outside is a raging. Will soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. So this quote to me is significant because there is so much in 2020 going on. And I believe that we have to reflect. We've had a lot of time with all of this COVID uh, moment and so, but we as a people have a reckoning coming upon us. And I think that when we watch politicians, yes, there is a lot to say negative and a lot to say positive about Said. And if I were to come here and just talk about, oh, all the great things that, that people would just say, man, that they son, he have to say that. To say yeah. And then if I were to come and give you my analysis of what went wrong, where he went wrong, then he has said, boy, I'm on blah, blah, blah. No matter what I say will be interpreted a certain way. And I have learned well that it's not how I feel towards your thought, but it's how I can listen to your thought and see how much of the other I can appreciate. Mm -hmm. Because it's very easy to dismiss people, right? Mm -hmm. 
But what, whether you agree or disagree, we cannot deny that the times are changing yeah. and that we are all responsible to take on certain tasks for the following day. And it's not about whether I like or dislike you. It is about how I can cooperate and collaborate and press a little bit forward. Look, if we give the illusion to our young people that, oh, Belize, you see this whole thing about, oh, we're a jewel, that is a brochure. That is for the BTB to spend millions of dollars developing a fantasy like Disney World, nothing wrong with that, yeah. so that others can come and then go on, on the rides and on the, um, you know, the different uh, activities. Mm -hmm. But that is a product, not no different than condensed milk. But the work of building a society and building a nation, that is a different ball game. What do you know him to be most proud of in what he's done? Well, I come back to education, I come back the to education. culture, and then you're throwing me into a rabbit hole again, because then I can go all over the place with those things. <laughs> I come, I come right. back to the... Let, let, me, let me flip it then. So, as an adult, as someone who, who has, has spent yep. a lot of your adulthood sharing in this experience, what have you been most intrigued about his political career that you wanted to pick his brain and understand his thought process about? That's great. All right. Here's how I would answer that today, but it might change in the next five minutes. Okay. But listen to this. <laughs> how can a person who is bombarded by all kinds of things, because listen, when you're criticized and when you're praised, it's the same thing. You know, oh, Mr. Musa, you're so great. I mean, there are a lot of psychophants that are around you too when you're in political life. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're amazing. So they just have, everything is blurred lines. That was, I think it was a Taylor Swift song, but, or maybe it's not. But this blurness, right? Oh, you're alone this, you're alone that, you're blah, 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 negative, positive. Those two t polar things, to me, are irrelevant. But I can just say it in the abstract. I'm not a politician. Mm -hmm. What I have noticed that he is able to do is maintain focus and maintain reading, thinking, listening, and developing, and then continuing to move forward. Because a lot of times, when you're being told all positive things, you get a completely false sense of reality and you become um, isolated in a way and you can't even hear anything. You're, like you're put on headphones, right? Mm -hmm. You just look pretty with the headphones. Or the opposite, when you're being bombarded, you could become demoralized, depressed, dejected, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So I think harnessing those two energies, like they're bipolar, and then walking right down in the middle with a clarity, a coherence as to what you are, are still to do, I think that is the essence of leadership. Mm. How to be like almost on a tight rope, but below you, something, oh, there's clouds and heaven, and something, there is fire. Yeah. But you can't be thinking, oh my gosh, it's heaven, make a jump, oh, it's fire, I can't, whatever. You just have to keep the balance. So the swimming thing comes back. Mm -hmm. You just have to keep swimming. So I think I would end with that as, a, as the main trait. Keep swimming. That's, Just keep that's swimming. what you. That's what you've been most fascinated by: his clarity and focus. Well, for now. But for now. Come on. For these five I minutes. Yeah. About, for these five I minutes. Like, so I forgot to mention Alvina. that part. <laughs> look, 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 if I were to give you interview you about Miss Alvina, who is a dear friend of mine, <laughs> you would agree that you can say amazing things about your mom now. Then this afternoon, another thing tomorrow then next year oh i forgot to say about this your brain <laughs> and i work. just remembered yeah that's yes. true that's true can so. i l l let me just ask one more question before we, we we run out of time you know the decision to um retire from politics tell us about that process was it something that you were able to discuss with him was it uh uh, a matter of being able to wait on doctors' consultations. Tell us about how that unfolded and what it was like, because your entire family has been in this process. Yeah. Okay, well, I think uh, there are a number of factors. And when you say retire, again, he was the um, leader of the party once. He was the prime minister once. So he, ha he you know, is used to this idea of moving okay. from one thing to the next, retiring yeah. or whatever, moving on. I would say that at the beginning, when the stroke first happened, it uh, medically, and I mean, I, I am in awe of uh, the medical team, uh, including Dr. Queer and Dr. Musa, my own brother, mm -hmm. and the many nurses. Notice again, we are erasing the the may, uh, other personnel because you know sometimes doctors are worshipped as heroes, but 
they were instrumental. I mean, their ability to be um, aware of what's happening and, and assigning, you know, diagnostic uh, issues. I, I was in awe of that. And you really rely on them to give you and you trust in them and, and they deliver, right? So as time progressed, he improved and improved. But I think now that we're in September, I think he announced last week, sometimes September, whatever, yeah. 8th or whatever, he realized that the election is imminent. He is still in the process of recovery and it would be unfair to the party to, you know, just, um, and of course, because of his uh, situation, he has to remain at home. He can't go out and expose himself. Uh, to COVID, as you know, in this in the situation with COVID, elderly are a vulnerable um, yeah. group. So there are a lot of factors, but um, and I and I obviously can't get into his mind and say what yeah. was the deciding factor. Mm -hmm. But I think he weighed it um, and he evaluated the situation and he came to that decision. Mm -hmm. And I fully support him in that, as I have supported him, and our family has supported him, and we are all behind him because I think. His uh, recovery is extremely important. Yeah. And I still believe, and I am trying to encourage him, that he can make a contribution with his ideas and reflection and have people uh, weigh in on it. If people don't want to weigh in, they just delete the email or delete the post or whatever. No big deal. Yeah. yeah um, we know that time is winding down. Um, but this is basically, and I, and I consider it to be historic, to actually be talking about the life of uh, Honorable Said Musa. I look at it that way because of the significant impacts on our, on our country. But he was also, he, you know, his professional life, besides being a politician, he was also a lawyer. Mm -hmm. what, what can you tell us about that aspect of his life? Well, he, to me, he's an, um, an outstanding lawyer. And I'm not saying that because he defended me uh, in any case. <laughs> uh, but... I have heard from many people that, you know, over the years and also in terms of constitutional matters and big issues of legal consequence, he has been uh, at the center of many of those things, whether it is land issues, water issues. Um, he has been, of course, in the 70s, as we talked earlier, uh, important person in developing the constitution which is a, a supreme law of our land which is the supreme law not a. Mm -hmm. and and so he understands the law but you know i don't <laughs> I, I i don't know how to uh, it's like um people i'll give you this joke people always used to like ask why you know in belize we have this very uh you know ask you things about why you don't do this why, why you don't do this because everybody knows better what you should be doing than what you should be doing. Oh, better you than anybody uh, else, right? Yes, exactly. So <laughs> we all are familiar with that beautiful part of our Sikh culture. They say, uh, why don't you run? Why don't you run for politics? And, so, and then I always say, and I remain with this idea, that if my father one day de decides to become an artist, I might consider it. I say, why you? You are like putting down artists by asking me that question. The point I am making is that the same way I feel about art, I know he feels about the law. Yeah. And, and I know this because of the way he conducts himself, the, the effort he puts into it, the focus, the mindfulness okay. that he puts into that profession. And I think, like anything else, if you're a guitar player or a lawyer, you have to then approach it that way. Mm, okay. Sir, uh, so what you're saying is there are no political aspirations from uh, Yasser Musa at this point? What I'm saying is that my father has not indicated to me that he wants to become an artist. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be a talented one too, right? <laughs> 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 if he's watching, he's laughing, guy. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure, Marlene. Come on. <laughs> we uh, we've got to go. I tell you what, we can't thank you enough. Uh, to have you on this show uh, today it's being a fun a Friday. Yeah. Today being a fun Friday to share with us. And we're 48 hours away from our independence. That's yes, right. Yes, we are. You know, you, you've definitely shed some wonderful light on the uh, life of your dad, uh, the right honorable side, Musa. Yes, sir. Thank you. All the very best. Right. Keep on doing what you're doing, right. buddy.
Respect. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Is it? All right. laughs> Marlene, that was a wonderful conversation. This is, uh, this is what we refer to as a fun Friday because that was actually fun. But the fun continues this morning. Our next segment is going to be upstairs inside that kitchen. Yes, where we make things with a flavor and a beat. Grace, flavor with a beat. That's coming up when we come back. Propaganda has been... We have to get rid of these devils. Yes, Arthur said it right. I have been called many things <laughs> by Mr. Barrow, in the house and outside the house. <laughs> but like I told him in Dangriga at the National Convention, you recall me one lot of things, but a few names think the road. You think I forget it? <laughs> but like I said, you know, before, don't watch me. Watch yourself now. <laughs> In poverty, where almost half of the population, almost half, is living in poverty and misery, while a few at the top flaunt ostentatious wealth, living the vida loca, with their Rolex watches and their Gucci bags and their fully loaded SUV Prados. Tinted, no less, yes. In, in the face, Mr. Speaker, of this growing income inequality in our country, for the Prime Minister to boast that he has increased the budget for, as the leader of the opposition pointed out, for boost, food pantry, and so on. That is an admission of failure. After six years of the UDP, there are more poor people in need of food assistance in Belize. That is an admission of failure. Shit, shit, shit. It is an indictment of the government. And for the Prime Minister to tell this nation, well, yes, maybe they could have set it, and maybe the court could have ordered it, but how can the court order anything to be done when the court doesn't have an army, doesn't have a police to enforce it? Mr. Prime Minister, last time I read or heard that said, it was by Hitler in Nazi Germany, you know. They have committed the biggest corruption. The biggest corruption. Because, I say that, when you look at the mess that the UDP Prime Minister has created through reckless misfeasance, and I use those words, reckless misfeasance, saddling the Belizean people with a debt of $95.6 million.